in the Gospel of John. Big themes in the Gospel of John. Um, as you can imagine, we're going to stay in the Gospel of John tonight. So just turn over there to John uh, chapter 1, and we'll work our way through some of these uh, themes in just a moment. Uh, John's Gospel is a great Gospel. And John's gospel, as you probably know, stands out from among the other three gospels. You have Matthew and Mark and Luke, and then all of a sudden comes John. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke with their commonality and their theme and in their, their approach. And then you have the gospel of John. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke giving us this, this uh, interwoven uh, picture of Jesus and who he is and the things that he did. And then you have the gospel of John. John is unique in his approach. Uh, John brings out to us these uh, standalone themes, these things that he wants to make sure that we come away with a better understanding of who Jesus is. We have to remember that John knows Jesus. He knows him. John is revealed to us throughout the New Testament. He wrote five books in the New Testament we're told that he was part of that inner circle with Jesus. He witnessed Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah in Matthew chapter 17. He was considered a pillar in the church in Jerusalem in Galatians 2 in verse 9. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved, John 13 in verse 23. He's the only disciple out of all of them to die of old age, to not die from some type of persecution. Uh, he worked alongside Peter. Um, he was one of the first four disciples to be called. And um, he, was a one, he was one who, as the first century was winding down, uh, John was left to be that senior, if you will. He was left to be that one connection that the world could have to that time in which Jesus walked the earth. John was unique. And his gospel is unique. Now, I make mention of this on your outline. We could take every single chapter of John and we could break it down into a, a theme. Some of them would have two themes to it or maybe even more, but we don't have time for that. So I've selected some of these big themes. Uh, some of the things that John goes uh, to great length to bring out to us so that our understanding, and I think this is the, the key purpose, so that our understanding of Jesus will be more complete. That it will be in the, in the best way that he can, in the time that he has, give us this, this thorough understanding of, of the one that we believe is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is our Savior of the world. John says, here he is. John says, let me give you a, a glimpse of this man and the things that he did. John pulls back that tapestry of time that separates us from Christ and says, here, through these words, you can know him. I'm going to be honest with you. I like the gospel of John. I like it. Well, let's look at a sampling of some of these themes in, in John's gospel. Go over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and as I mentioned, we're going to stay in this, this gospel the whole time. John chapter 1, and beginning there in verse 1, you see that John brings out the theme that Jesus is divine. And John begins at, I think, the most important place. He begins, I mean, the birth of Christ is important, and you see that in the gospels. The infancy of Christ is important, and you, you, you see that in the Gospels. And I mean, all of those things have weight and merit and, and worth to them. But John begins at perhaps the most important part. Jesus is unique. That Jesus stands alone. He begins out of all the places where he could start with the divinity of Jesus Christ. Really, if you think about it this way, that's John's theme throughout his whole Gospel. But he begins with the understanding that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Go down to verse 14. And the Word, the very one that John wrote about in those first three verses. And the Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says he was real. John says the one that I'm writing about isn't one that was a figment of somebody's imagination. It wasn't a, a, a fable that was put together about a man who lived among us. He was real. He, he came in the flesh and you could touch him and put your hands around him and know him and see him and talk to him. Experience a relationship with him. The, gospel, the, the, the Jesus of John's gospel is a living person. And he brings that out. He goes on, and like I said, we won't hit every single chapter. He goes on, and he talks about the theme of how Jesus has come to save. He, he speaks of his divinity, then he says, let me tell you about his purpose. Let me tell you about the important thing that stands out in Jesus, which he did that nobody else could do. And you go over to the third chapter of John. John chapter 3, beginning there, I want to give you two verses, beginning there in verse uh, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There's his mission statement. This is why he's come into the world. He's come to do something that's not only unique, he's come to do something that's, that's certainly never been done before in the history of humanity. You go back to the first chapter of Genesis, you work your way over to the last chapter of Revelation, and you only see Christ as the Savior of mankind. He's the one and only. John brings out this theme. He wants us to know and to understand the importance of this. Jesus alone can fulfill this role. I... I don't know if you get any bigger than that in what his purpose was. Luke addresses that in Luke 19 and verse 10. Again, Jesus is the one who's going to speaking like he is here in John chapter 3. And he says, for the Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why I'm here. I'm a saving Messiah. I'm the saving Christ. John moves on through his gospel, and if you go over to John, you're in chapter 3, go over to chapter 6, John chapter 6, and beginning there in verse 16, John teaches us that Jesus controls the laws of nature, that the physical elements that bind us don't bind Christ. Now, think about that. That the limitations that come from the law of nature are not limitations that are opposed upon Christ. He's greater than those limitations. Now, we certainly aren't. We're certainly bound by those things. But John gives us this understanding, this theme of Jesus being greater. He records this. Now, when evening came, verse 16, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because of a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Wonderful things are happening. Here's the storm. They're in the midst of it. And what do they see? Christ. The wind is blowing. The waves are being tossed to and fro. And who do they see? Christ. They're in this unique situation in, in which it demands all of their attention, their time. Some of those men are seasoned fishermen. They know what happens when the waves get out of control. They know that procedures need to be followed when the wind blows up. And in the midst of all of that comes one who defies the very laws of nature, and it is Christ. John brings this out. John wants us to see it and know it and to understand that it's Jesus who's fulfilling this role, that it's Jesus whose ability and might and power and authority is greater than any laws that would bind us. What a great thing. John goes on. You're in chapter 6. Go over to John chapter 10. 
John chapter 10, and beginning there, and we'll begin in verse 11 and work our way down. But John gives us the theme that Jesus is the good shepherd, that, that Jesus is the one who watches over us, that he is the one that leads us, that he is the one that provides that protection and that security for us. We kind of lose a little bit of it in this day and age, well, maybe a lot of it. Because probably everybody here has never been a shepherd. <laughs> maybe, maybe you have been. Um, and in our culture, you don't see shepherds everywhere out in the fields walking along. You don't see that. But in the first century, you did. And the role of the shepherd was important. The role of the shepherd was important. He guided the sheep. He protected the sheep. He was there to strengthen and encourage the sheep. Don't go astray. Don't come back. Come back over here. This is where you need to be. The shepherd did all of these things. He protected him from the bad guys as well as the bad elements. So a shepherd was important. John, as he's writing through inspiration, says, um, um, that's Jesus. And that's who Jesus is. He's that, that good shepherd. John, in recording what Jesus said, said these words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the, she who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and am known by my sheep. As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father and I lay down my life for my sheep. It's a total commitment. I'll give absolutely everything I possibly can. I'll put my life on the line. And he does. Christ on the cross. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, the Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. That is the church of Christ. That one flock are Christians, New Testament Christians, brought into that one flock with one shepherd. Not a multiplicity of shepherds, not a shepherd for this and a shepherd for that, and a shepherd that handles this. One shepherd who is Christ. Remember what I said, a shepherd is important. John's big theme is that Christ, as the good shepherd, is important. Go over just one chapter. Go over to chapter 11. Chapter 11, uh, beginning there in verse 38. John gives us the theme that Jesus has authority over death. There are finalities in life, brethren. There are... Uh, things that come upon us that regardless of what takes place, man can't stop, man can't change, man can't avoid, man can't run from. And death is certainly one of those things. It, it, it has that sway over us. We think about it. We, we sometimes worry about it. We're grieved because of it. Death has a powerful presence in our life. And John gives us a theme that Christ comes and deals with that power or that worry or that thing that has the sway or the hold over us. That Jesus, in a way that only he could, deals effectively with death. John says this in verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. The, the, uh, the story of Lazarus. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, that should, hold, that should stop you, Jesus. I mean, something bad has taken place to this person in the tomb, and, and that should be enough that we're telling you that, listen, it's going to be bad if you take away that stone. So this is, this is the, the place where you stop. You see, this is where you've, you've expressed your, uh, your, your care and concern for him. You've expressed your care and concern for us. And, and we appreciate that. But, but listen, you can't go any further than that. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, verse 40, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone, that barrier. 
Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. I'm going to show two things, not only his authority over death, but the authority of who he is. This is going to reveal these things to them, and it reveals it to us. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. There's the sudden pause in our theology. There's where we kind of hold our breath and we want to know what's going to happen. The command has been given. It's his second command, by the way. Did you notice that? The first one is roll away the stone. Well, nothing miraculous in that. Sure, let's get a couple people. Let's roll away the stone. Okay, it, it's, it's, a, it's a simple command. The second speaks to the divinity of Christ. It's a command where he says to Lazarus, you come back to life. You come forth. You walk out of that tomb. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. You see, there's no doubt that he was dead. There's no doubt that he'd been prepared for burial. He comes out looking like he was when they put him in. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him. Let him go. Not only is he loosed from the bindings that were wrapped around his body, he's loosed from the grave. Not only do they have a, a physical thing that needs to be done, but they're witnessing a spiritual thing that has taken place. That's a big theme to John. That's something that John wants to get out there. I mean, we began with the divinity of Christ back there in chapter 1. We've worked our way through and we've seen things that Christ has done coming to save. We've seen that he's above the laws of nature. We've seen that he alone is that good shepherd that is so desperate for us. And now we see his authority over the area of death. John wants us to know it. Go over, if you will, a couple chapters. Go over to John chapter 13 and beginning in verse 3. John 13 and verse 3. And John gives us the theme of Jesus' humility. Now, you know the end of the story. You, you know the life of Christ. You've, you've read the accounts. You know who Jesus is. You know ultimately that the cross is his destination, that he's going to die and shed his blood for humanity. You, you know that. You see it. You know that he's going to be resurrected. You know that he's going to say personally to his disciples, I'm going to come back. There's going to be, you know, I'm going to be here again. You know, you, you know the, the, the whole story. And one of the things that should stand out is the humility of Christ and knowing who he is and what he did. The humility of Christ. Well, you ought to do what I say because, because I'm of the Father and the Father and I are one. So just do what I say. But you don't find that. You see, the humility of Christ. John brings out the understanding that this isn't a Savior who came demanding to us, you will do it or else. That's not Christ. He was humble. And the you will do it turns into, I, I want you so desperately to do it. The you will follow me becomes, listen, follow me. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one. I can help you. John brings this out. In John chapter 13, beginning in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Do you see it? God in the flesh is washing the feet of his creation. You get it, right? You, 
you see the magnitude of what's taking place, right? I mean, it, it jumps off the page. It's this theme that John wants us to grasp and to know and to come away with and to understand. Here is the, the creator of all. Here is the Messiah that had been long prophesied and preached about. Here's the one who has come. And how does he manifest himself among his creation? I'm going to wash their feet. Humility. Now, I suppose we couldn't blame Jesus as he, if he came as the Jews thought he would, some conquering king, some conquering Messiah. I, I suppose we could wrap our hands around the idea that Jesus would lead some angelic army and would, would crush those who doubt and disbelieved in him. I, I suppose if, if that's the way the story went, we could say, I, I, I could see it. Knowing who Jesus is, I, I can see why that's taking place. But that's not the story. The story is a basin of water and a towel. The story is washing that dirty part of their body. The one who kneels at their feet is the one that we will all one day kneel before. The one who washes their feet is the one who has washed away our sins in the blood of his sacrifice. It's a big deal to John. It's a big theme to John. Stay there and go over just one chapter. Go over to chapter 14. John chapter 14. And I'll give you just one verse. We're cutting into a good passage here. One verse. And John gives us the theme that Jesus is the way to the Father. He's the seeking Savior. He's the good shepherd. He's the one that has come for his creation. He's the one who's willing to humble himself before that, which bears his spiritual fingerprints as being a creation of himself. And now you begin to see that there in, in verse 6, now you begin to see that he gives us that direction that we need. That he tells us that there's a way to the Father. That that relationship with God can be restored. That, that, that there is a way for humanity. There is a way for creation that has gone away from God. Rebelled against God, if you will. Disobeyed God. Disavowed God. Been disloyal to God. There, there's, there's, there's hope for that. And the hope in John's theme is it lies in Jesus. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, listen, except. Look again. No one comes to the Father, you see it, except through me. I'm the only way. It's that theme in which John says, if, if you want access to the Father, then you need to go through the Son. It's John giving us this theme and saying, listen, it matters that you have access to the Father. And that access is given through only one individual, and that's the Son. This is a role that only Jesus could fulfill. And he did. Go over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and notice beginning there in verse 20. John brings out the, the theme of unity through Christ. He talks about a world that certainly had division. Uh, a world that struggled at times with, with, with unity. Um, and he talks about one who wants there to be that the, the importance of it, that wants there to be that, that unity in, in one's understanding of God and his relationship with God and his relationship with those around him who are of like-minded, that unity is, is an important aspect of all of them getting together and remaining together. So it's that theme of unity in Christ. And John records Jesus' words as saying this, verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's, that's you and me. I believe in Christ because of the themes of John. I, I believe in Christ because of the things that Peter wrote. So do you. 
He says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that they may believe that you sent me. There's no disunity between me and my Father, Jesus is saying. There's no fraction between me and my Father, Jesus is saying. And the same thing that he and I enjoy, I want for my followers. I want for others. As we have unity, I want them to have unity. And this is what I'm praying for, Father. He says, He says, As you are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one and he goes on I and them and you and me but the understanding is given that there is a desire and a hope that Jesus has for those who will follow him and I suppose he could have said there are a lot of hopes that he has but definitely one of them is unity. I want them to be united in the cause of Christ. I want them to be united in the purpose of evangelism. I want them to be united in the understanding of reaching a world that is filled with disunity. I want them to be united as a symbol, as a sign, as a showing that I had unity with you and they should have unity with one another because of who we are. It's John's theme. It's what he's bringing out. Go over to John chapter 20. It's a unique role that Jesus fulfills. John chapter 20. And beginning there in verse 19. Now let me say one more time. Just for the purpose of, of, of clarity. I, I, I do not doubt that you could take each chapter. And sometimes you could find more than one theme in each chapter. I get it. I understand it. I, I don't intentionally mean to skip over any chapters. Because there's not important. Or, or there's not information that is in that chapter. That's not important. It's time, brethren. It's, it's, it's time that limits us. And so John begins to bring his gospel to a close. And in chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, John gives us the theme of a resurrected Lord. John ends on a high note. John, if you will, begins with the birth narrative of Christ. And he ends with the resurrection of Christ. He begins with birth, right? And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John chapter 1 and verse 14. That's his birth. That's him coming. I've heard people say time and time again, there's no birth narrative in the gospel of John. Sure there is. It's one verse long. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Christ in the manger. That's Christ coming into the world. And he has suffered that persecution. He has gone to the cross. And he has sacrificed himself. John gives us the understanding in his gospel that it was a freely, freely act that Jesus willingly gave himself. They didn't drag him. They didn't force him. They didn't put him under compulsion. John gives us the understanding and the theme of the crucifixion of Christ that he was willing to go, that he was willing to do it because he understood the larger purpose. They're not just killing a man. They're killing God in the flesh. John brings this out. But John doesn't end his gospel with Christ in the tomb. It, um, how do I, it, it just wouldn't be right. It, it just doesn't, what, doesn't, doesn't sit well with us. Where, where's the victory? Where's the power? Where's the authority? We understand the sacrifice. We get it. Like I said, we know the complete story. We're reading back. We're looking back into these events. We know the ultimate outcome. We know he's victorious. We, we know that he gets resurrected, but we're reading back into the account and we're seeing in the crucifixion of Christ that theme that there needed to be that offering for us. The offering that only Christ could give. He alone can fulfill that role. 
John brings us to the next level. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, he talks about the resurrection. He says this, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I'm here. I've, I'm alive. You, you, you want to make sure it's me? Well, well, look. I bear the marks of the crucifixion. Marks that I'll remind you were given for us. You see the same thing in the, in the revelation that John has given. When you get a glimpse of the lamb. John talks about seeing a lamb looking as if he'd been slain. That's Christ. He's never ashamed of the cross. Never. Not even in eternity. He never shies away from the cross. He never says that I'm embarrassed by the cross. He embraces it. Shouldn't we? But John gives us the theme of a resurrected Lord. One who is alive. One who has conquered uh, death. One who can stand before his creation. Not as one who's been brought down into defeat. But one who has been resurrected to life. I like that theme. Can I be honest with you? I don't want to serve just a crucified Christ who's in the grave this very day. I want to serve the one who had power and authority to put death in its place. I want to serve a resurrected Christ, one who came out of the grave. And I suppose you're a lot like me. Themes, brethren. These are these big ideas, these big themes that, that John wants us to see and, and to understand. That John, in, in the time that he has, wants to give us these, these glimpses of who Jesus is. This one who had this unique relationship with me. Why, John, that's the disciple I love. What's unique there? Something's taking place. Something happened. There was something in the relationship between John and Christ. And this is the one who's writing, I know Jesus. And John writes so that you and I can know Jesus. Well, this is where we end up. Do we know Christ? Are these themes enough? And they're brief glimpses. I, I understand that. But are they enough to give us an understanding of who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and why Jesus did it? I will argue Day and night with you. I will challenge you. I will defy you. I will argue with you that John gives us everything we need to know and understand about Christ and his mission. That there's nothing left out. That there's no stone left unturned. That John says, if I'm going to tell you about Christ, if I'm going to write this gospel, then you're going to come away knowing him. Understanding him. Being amazed by him. Aren't we? John says, uh, I know Jesus. And because of the pen of John, now we know Jesus. Big themes. Let, let me ask you a, a, a question. How big is Jesus to you? You don't serve an insignificant Lord, do you? you? You don't serve a Lord with limitations, do you? You don't serve a Lord who has to strive and struggle just to get his point and his purpose across. That's a, that's a little Savior. And John will have nothing of it. Jesus was big, so his things were big. How big is he to you? Think about it. Let me extend to you the invitation this evening. If you are here and you are not a New Testament Christian, 
because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because of that resurrection from the dead, because of that promise that he'll one day return, we need to be ready as a people of faith. We need to be prepared for that moment when either Christ will return or we will die and go to the Hadean realm and wait for that return. You need to obey the gospel plan of salvation to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. That's not some outdated plan. It's very much alive, active, and has power and authority today. If you haven't done that, I say as compassionately as I can, you need to. Or if you're here and you're in need of prayer or encouragement, how can we help you? How can we stand by your side and, and give you the support that you need? If you're subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing. Oh, uh -huh.